And your Father, Father promises never to leave us nor forsake us. That nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not wars, not pestilence, not trials, nothing. We praise your holy name. This morning as we come into the sanctuary to honor you, to praise you, to worship you. We pray it may be acceptable in your sight and be pleasing to you. For we come in Christ's name. Amen. Take your hymnal once again, turn to hymn number 531.
I hope you are pleased to go. Hey, Leslie, yes, I know, turn me on. Yeah, what would you do without me? I'm pleased to be here this morning because I believe God continues to work and I've been blessed. Uh, it just, wow. One thing you should know about Eric and Edgar, Eric is, you didn't know, Eric uh, is going on his motorcycle to get Edgar and so he's going to have to strap Edgar on the back somehow. And uh, so you can pray for Edgar to stay on that thing. Uh, <laughs> you don't have a sidecar for that, do you? No. So he's going to have to hold on for how long a trip is it? 14 hours? Yeah, Edgar's going to be pretty pooped out, but he'll probably have a lot of bugs eaten by then. So. <laughs> Uh, you ever heard of anybody taking another fellow 14 hours each way, just out of the goodness of your heart? That's scary for you. But anyway, yeah. It is uh, Memorial Day tomorrow, and I appreciate the back of the bulletin that gives us some idea what's going on in the village. I also appreciate that Pastor Phillips is, still continues to be directly involved in those Memorial Day services. I think that's dynamite, and I appreciate it. And I'm sure the veterans appreciate your participation there. I think you must be well respected to be, uh, continue to be asked. And I assume that Natalie Harder is one of the Harder clan. And she's singing. That's got to be pretty cool. So, um, yeah, if you have an opportunity and you're in the village and tomorrow, take it in. One of the things that I've been thinking about as our service uh, title suggests, remembering sacrifice. Um, not long ago, there was, a, there was a, a movie out. It was called Hacksaw Ridge. I don't recommend that any of you go see it. I haven't seen it. I've only watched portions of it because I wanted to know what it was about. And it's an extraordinarily violent, bloody, gory war movie. It's not the kind of thing that you take your girlfriends to go see because it would just gross you out, you wouldn't be able to watch it. I mean, it is pretty vile. It's pretty, uh, we call it realistic. But um, I was curious because the movie is about a person that I didn't know about. And uh, it turns out the person it is focused on is it was a young man called Desmond Doss. Have you seen that movie? You could probably watch it, but I don't think your wife would. Anyway, it is uh, a story about this young man who um, is a believer, although he's a Seventh-day Adventist, and you may have an issue with that, but he believes Scripture when it said that Scripture teaches we're not to take another life. And so when he was drafted into the military during the middle of World War II, he uh, he could have gotten out as a conscientious objector, but he did not. He refused to do so because he said, maybe I can do more good putting lives back together as other guys are blown apart. And so he became a medic. And when his training was complete, he was sent overseas to Okinawa in 1945. It was toward the end of the war. Okinawa was uh, like all of the... Uh, uh, islands in the Pacific, they were all terrible bloody battles and great loss of life. And there was a, like in Normandy, in one section of Normandy, France, where there were a sheer cliff that you had to scale to get to the top, the top of what was held by the enemy, the Japanese. And somehow or another, previous regiments or battalions had made it to the top and dropped this cargo netting down over the side of this cliff and, and Desmond Doss's battalion's challenge orders were to ascend this wall on these cargo ropes and attack the enemy and beat them back. As it turned out, the Japanese were well entrenched as they always were on these islands and the, while the Navy bombarded the top of that hill, for hours and hours, they couldn't dislodge the enemy because they were buried deep in the coral and the rock underground. So that when the artillery barrage let up, out came the J 
Japanese, and they moved into their foxholes and their sniper positions. And so when the Americans made it to the top, they let most of the battalion get up on the top, and then they cut loose on them. And they were destroyed. Desmond Doss made it to the top without a rifle or an armament in his hand of any sort and began to immediately minister medical aid to all those who were wounded and still alive. And there were a lot of dead, but there were still a lot alive. As the battle went on, they discovered that they couldn't hold the top of the hill. I may not get all this accurately, for I only saw bits and pieces of it, but as I understand, as I read Desmond Doss's biography, this is so, pretty much what happened. His battalion was ordered to retreat to come off the top of that hill, scale back down to the bottom, where they would come under the protective fire of other soldiers. The problem is, is that there were so many wounded men at the top of the hill that those wounded men could not come and climb down that cargo rope by themselves. They were too weak, they were too wounded, they were unconscious, they lost too much blood. And so all the battalion went back down that could physically, except for one physically able man, and that was Desmond Doss. Desmond Doss went from man to man, and when he saw the Japanese advancing toward the edge of the cliff, he knew he had to act with some uh, rapid choices. Because as the Japanese came out, which was their typical custom, any Americans they found wounded, they would shoot immediately. They wouldn't offer any medical aid, they just killed them right on the spot. So if you were wounded, you were as good as dead. It's difficult, and even the Army records can't be positive, but what the number of men he rescued single handedly. By himself, there was no other able-bodied man to help him. <clears throat> he dragged at least 75 wounded men to the edge of the cliff, wrapped one of these big cargo ropes, made a harness for these guys, and by himself, he lowered over 75 wounded soldiers over the cliff to the bottom of the cliff where they received immediate medical attention. All the while, the Japanese are trying to kill him, shooting him. And while they were close, and he even had opportunity to kill some of them himself, he chose not to because of his conviction. Regardless of whether it was the enemy or not, mattered little to him. The scriptures were clear, he shouldn't take a life. That was his understanding. Before that experience, his statement of faith didn't mean much to the other soldiers. What are you, a chicken? What are you, a coward? You're not going to carry a gun into battle? What kind of a man are you? A man will kill his enemy. That's what a real man does in war. That's what men do. He was mocked, demeaned, talk about bullied. He was beaten up. He was rejected. He was ostracized until that day where he lowered 75 men over the cliff and saved their lives. If not for him, they would have all perished at the top of the hill. Why did he do that? Because of his faith, faith without actions for those soldiers didn't mean anything. But faith with action acted heroically to save his brothers in arms changed their attitude at all. They were ordered several days later to reascend to the top of that the cliffside. And there's a scene in the movie that's very poignant. Desmond Doss could have gone on a hospital ship because he'd been nicked and wounded, but can you imagine letting, he had no gloves and he had this hemp rope and he lowered 75 men down the hill with bare hands, hand over hand, and with a hemp rope, which burned and cut his hands. There was not a whole lot left of the fingers and skin and palms. It was just bloody. He refused to go to the hospital ship. And several days later, they were tasked with going back to the top again. And he went again. 
Faith in action. One of the things that I am so impressed with on Memorial Day and Veterans Day is there are men who have more faith in action than I do. And that's why we honor these people, these veterans who have sacrificed their lives, who have sacrificed, their families have sacrificed. Everyone is wounded. We find out these days men and women coming back from uh, the Middle East and Afghanistan who are suffering from PTSD, is that how you say it? Um, struggled with that for years and years and years and marriages. They become, in many cases, drug addicts or addicted to one thing or another or become homeless and recluse or they become a criminal element because so many terrible, horrible things have happened to them in war and battle that can't be explained. When my dad was, and maybe you know some men like this, my dad served in World War II in the South Pacific, he never, ever talked about his battle experiences in war. Never mentioned a word to him until the week before he died, and I asked him specifically when he was in Robert Packard uh, uh, Cardiac Care, Intensive Care Unit. Dad, whatever happened in the war? And he could barely talk about it then, the end of his life. We honor these people because they carry things with them far beyond the battle itself. Things that become embedded in their minds and hearts that are almost impossible to clear, to, to, to vacate from your mind. The scenes that you've seen, the loss of friends, the, the, the tragedy of innocent civilians who are killed, maimed, lose everything. And why do they do that? For free. Even God did that. And in the book of Joshua, which we read for, for our scripture reading, and I only want to mention it briefly, God had memorials. And what happens in Joshua chapter 4 is so typical of what God intended for his Old Testament memorials. He never wanted people to forget what he had done for them. That's the big deal. God is so wise perfectly. He knew that we as human beings would forget what we have done for Him unless we set a memorial to God's action, His faithfulness. And so He charges Joshua to gather the twelve men from the twelve tribes to gather these stones. Somehow I get this picture of some big burly guy holding this monster rock. That's my picture. That might not be accurate, but that's what I picture. I don't see Rachel carrying a big rock around like that and say, okay, God, whatever you say. Anyway, I see this happening, and they take these rocks, and they pick them up, and they do what Joshua says, because Joshua received this marching order from God who says, you do this, and you do this for a reason, because I never want you to forget that I parted the Jordan for you. I did this miraculous, supernatural thing for you because I love you and I care for you and you're my special people. And so in chapter 4, verse 6, it's to be a sign. A sign for what? If the rocks, this, this pile of rocks isn't there, and people don't stumble across it. Or your children. You may take your children, adults, to the Jordan and see this pile of rocks and they'll say, Hey, Dad, what's the deal with this pile of rock? And you can say to them, I remember the day. They are, they, we set them down as a monument because God parted the waters of the Jordan and made it right dry land for us to go across. And, and we put them there as a memorial to God's greatness. Powerful. You get to tell your children what it means. That's why, for those of you who have ever uh, been privileged uh, to see the Patriot Riders, maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. I've, I've, I've only seen this on two occasions. Once was they were escorting the remains to Bath Cemetery, and I knew their schedule and. 
I waited uh, on 36, I think it's 36 out here, down on Presby Corner Presbyterian Road. And I waited there with just a couple of other people. I had no idea what it would do to me. It was stirring to watch these rough and tumble motorcycle guys. I mean, they looked like they just came out of a bar somewhere and they'd been in a knife fight. But these guys knew how to honor the guys who had given everything. And they escorted the remains of this soldier. I don't know whether he had fallen in recent battle or what. It didn't matter. It was stirring. I stood there. I didn't know what to do. And I still don't. I didn't know whether I was supposed to put my hand over my heart. What am I supposed to do? I was awestruck that these men were going to honor every veteran who was going to a veteran cemetery or not. And they did it without pay. They did it within a, a day's notice on many occasions. And they did it willingly, freely, and cheerfully to honor their comrades. That's something. I was at a, a, a funeral for a friend who was, had been in the military and who had passed away. And they invited the Patriot writers. This was a funeral over in, in uh, Livonia. And I went in a little late. I wasn't doing the service. Uh, I was just a friend of the fellow who passed away. And all these motorcycles were in the parking lot of the funeral home. They didn't even know the guy. They didn't need to know the guy. They just honored him for their, his sacrifice and service to the country. And they knew if they didn't do it, probably wouldn't be very many other people who would. It's an incredible thing. We do the same as God, much the same. Like that pattern of rocks in the, in the, near the Jordan, as a reminder and a sign that this is what God has done for you. We do the same thing. We make our monuments, our reminders out of granite and cement and stone. And they're all over the country. They're all over the country. But most of them, or at least a lot of them, are in Washington, D.C. Did you know, do you have any idea how many veterans are buried in Arlington Cemetery? Over 400,000. It's mind boggling, isn't it? And that's just one cemetery. There are 135 other veteran cemeteries around the United States, all bulging at the seams with veterans who are buried. The officials at Arlington Cemetery in Washington don't know what to do, they need more room. They've run out of space, or quickly are running out of space. We build these monuments. We make cemeteries, these beautiful, beautiful places. It doesn't include the cemeteries in, uh, in Normandy, where thousands upon thousands of Americans are buried. There is... For my generation, one of the most stirring, and I must confess, I admit to you that I did not serve in the military during the Vietnam era. But if you are from my generation, if you have ever seen the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall and are not stirred, there's probably something really wrong with you. Or you don't understand what that monument is a sign of. There are a lot of my friends' names who are on that wall, and maybe you know some of them too. They gave everything. It's an unusual monument, but it is one of the most visited monuments in the United States. It was one of the most controversial in its design. There's a World War II monument in the same general area in Washington. There is a Holocaust Museum. Although there are certain forces in our world culture that denies that the Holocaust during World War II never took place, we know it did factually, we have the proof, and there is a museum there. The museum itself is a monument 
But in one of those rooms, I've never been able to get there yet, but a number of people who have. Has anybody been to the Holocaust Museum? Did you go through it? There is one room filled with shoes. It's a monument. And the watchword of the Holocaust Museum is never again. Never again. Never forget. And never again. God is extraordinary. Forget not. Remember the sacrifice. But let me just say this. And I'm not negating all that I have said. But let me just say this. That our monuments that exist are for dead people. I scrapped my brain trying to think of what monuments are there for living people. Can you think of any? I could come up with one. We build monuments for people who sacrifice for you and I, for people who are heroes, for the father of our country. We build a memorial for Abraham Lincoln. We have these monuments in stone for dead people. Do you know we have no monuments to Jesus Christ? who is our ultimate hero, who sacrificed everything for you and I? There are no monuments. Do you know why? Because he's alive. He's not dead. It is the most exciting sort of hero to have, that one who defeated death and sin and was victorious over them so that I could have life. And not only that, but that my hero, my divine warrior, is still alive today because he rose from the dead and was victorious over that. And he doesn't need a monument because you and I are his monuments. We are his living stones. We are, as Scripture says, lively stones. And we build the monument by our lives of Christ in us. Let's turn to Romans chapter 5, just quickly. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here this morning, but simply to remind us, I go through life kind of carefree, to be honest with you. Sure, I have trials, tribulations, and issues that I wrestle with, so do you. <clears throat> but I've never been called upon by my country to serve or to sacrifice my life. John McCain, uh, speaking about earlier, before it became fair game in our culture, for everybody to beat the garbage out of everybody else, and people started picking on John McCain and said, well, he'd been more of a hero if he hadn't been taken prisoner. You've heard people talk like that. That would be punched in the face. Dis dishonor a man who was tortured and held captive as a prisoner of war for how many years? I don't know, six, seven years? I don't remember how many. Anything more than a, an hour would have been more than enough for me. Remarkable man. Remarkable man. He said, the real heroes are the guys who got drafted and died. They didn't sign up for that, but they paid the ultimate price anyway. Not like the volunteers who just wanted to go gun haul and kill a bunch of Vietnam Cong guys. The draftees were like, I don't really want to go. I heard stories about that place over there in Southeast Asia. I don't know, I'm carrying crazy about going. John McCain says, those are the guys are real heroes. The guys that got drafted and went anyway. Even if they didn't know what they were fighting for, didn't know the cause, didn't care for the people, didn't want to be there. They still did their duty. Those are the heroes. In Romans chapter 5, I'd just like to read this. This, is, this to me is so powerful because this tells me, it tells us about Christ, the ultimate divine warrior who sacrificed himself so that I can live. Like Desmond Doss lowering over 75 wounded soldiers to save their life, my hero hung on a cross and bled and died. 
He didn't just get burned hands. He had nail-pierced hands. He was humiliated, debased, tortured, scourged for me. That's my hero. Now, that does not diminish Desmond Doss at all. Because what he did is indeed heroic. And I do not think I have that same sort of courage in me. I don't think I am that kind of man. I don't think I have that sort of determination, resolve. I don't know. I've never been tested in the fire of combat. Nobody's ever shot a gun at me. Well, except for one guy who thought I was a deer, and that was scary enough. I hit the dirt quick. Those slugs make a funny sound when they go by. I think I backslid that day when I finally brave enough to start yelling, it may have not been edifying language. So I confess that to the man who did that was more than apologetic and scared to death because he could have easily gone the other way. He'd been calling 911 for a medevac for me. Chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Amen. And not only this so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations work in patience. Not so much amen. I don't like tribulations. I don't like death. But if you say so, God, that's my marching orders. I'll do what you say. And hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's me. That's you. He did it for you while we were still his enemies. Amen. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet for adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love toward us in that... Oh, I love this phrase. Think about this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for me. I am stirred by monuments like the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And they even had a traveling one. It was, there was one in Hornell a couple of years ago at the Harley Davidson place. And then moved into Rochester, just going to a modified form of it is stirring in my heart to be so close to men of valor, honor, but to read this verse, to read this verse that when Pastor Seeley was still not a pastor, just a sinner, unsaved, unjustified, an enemy of my Savior, Christ died. That's stirring. It should be stirring us. If you have never accepted that truth, this morning can I invite you to accept that truth? That we are God's sinners until that moment we receive the sacrifice of Christ for you and me. It's as simple as that. You can't earn heaven. You can only come to the foot of the cross and say, Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice for me. I am a sinner without any merit. And the only standing I have before the throne of God the Father is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 8. Excuse me. Verse 9. Much more than now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Memorial Day is a special day for Americans, and it is for many across the world who celebrate their military, their heroes. 
those who sacrifice for us. They are to be remembered and praised so we never remember, we never forget that the price of our free freedom in the United States of America was purchased cheaply. It was purchased because someone else died so that you can sit in these pews this morning. You understand what I mean? We should never forget that. We can never get too casual, too trivial. We should teach our children. But I have things to do tomorrow. I hear my children saying, I don't want to go to the parade. I don't want to go to the monument. I don't need to hear Pastor Phillips pray at those three ceremonies. Teach your children that their freedom was bought by someone else's blood. And our freedom as believers have been brought by Jesus' blood. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace toward us. You are such a glorious and wonderful God that saved us even while we were yet your enemies. Why would you do that? We thank you, Father, for you are our ultimate hero. There was no hero greater than Jesus Christ who rescued us from the judgment of sin. Thank you, Father, for Desmond Doss who acted on faith and refused to take another life and yet saved so many more because of his act of faith and courage. He delivered men from death to life. And that's exactly what you did, Jesus. And we will be forever thankful on this Memorial Day. In Jesus' name. Take your hymnal and turn to hymn number 530. 530, the battle hymn of the Republic. In there, please stand with me.
such a great old hymn. And when we sing that phrase, uh, the watchfires from a hundred camps encircled, during the time of the Civil War was one of the time of the greatest revivals as men turned to Christ because of the great carnage that happened. Many men were saved in both Union and Southern camps as they came to Christ. A powerful time. Let us pray together. Father, tomorrow, this country will celebrate Memorial Day. Today, we celebrate the sacrifice of our ultimate hero, Jesus Christ. We remember those men and women who have shed their blood that we have the freedom to sit here in these pews. Thank God for them. Take them into your careful watch care and be gracious unto them. Exercising tender mercy, we pray over them. We thank you for them. We thank you for this country and the freedom it has been afforded. But we are reminded, as the Apostle Paul says, for freedom has Christ set us free. And we are indeed free from sin and its judgment. Send us in this place rejoicing that we have a Savior who loved us when we were still his enemies and died for us. Nevertheless, thank you for loving us, Father. Send us forward in joy. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.